Today with me is author and director of Microsoft for Global Cybersecurity and AI and Emerging Technology, and His Excellency Omran Sharaf, Assistant Foreign Minister for Advanced Science and Technology. So as you can see, this panel discussion is geotech and new reality, question mark. So this is the answer that we're going to get today. Is it a new reality? To start with, we need to talk about what geotech is first, because personally, I never thought that there was a term for it. I always thought that it was geopolitics, but it's technically geopolitics and technology. So as we embark on a new era marked by groundbreaking technological advancements, the very fabric of global power is flux. Artificial intelligence, robotics, quantum computing, biotechnology, every single country, every single nation is competing over this. And we're all aware that this also brings a balanced power dynamic between nations. So this is the conversation that we're going to talk about today. With no particular order, my first question is for Nicholas. I want to know, how are technological advancements fundamentally altering the balance, the global balance of power? Thank you, Dana. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. Um, before I go into it, I just want to say congratulations to the hosts. I have to say ACTA and, and ACESSR have done an absolutely amazing job. We were just talking about that behind the scenes. Um, very well done. I look forward to coming back next year. Um, and then also an honor to be here with His Excellency. I, I was joking with him earlier that you often don't see engineers become diplomats, uh, but I think that might be the key to his success. Um, and so to, to go into your question, uh, yesterday, um, uh, great program, but I really paid attention to the session with Ambassador Zhang and, and, and His Excellency Dr. Johnny. And I think His Excellency said it very well yesterday and very clear but simple. Uh, we are living in a fragmented world. Um, the link between technology and geopolitics is not new. That's always been there. Technology advancements have meant economic, military uh, power, and therefore governments have tried to manage that manage the national security externalities that come from that. That's not new. Um, what is new is we had a brief moment after the Cold War where we lived in part in, because we lived in unipolarity with US at the center, we had a singular global IT stack that was being developed. And in particular in Silicon Valley, there was this belief that with advancements of technology, we live in a world where national borders no longer matter. And I think today, a lot of technology companies have woken up to a new geopolitical reality. EY CEO Paul's survey last year highlighted 97% of surveyed CEOs, that's 1,200 CEOs from uh, the, the 5,000 largest companies in the world, all said they have changed investment decisions in, in commercial strategy in part due to geopolitics. And so I think we are now in what we call in the book a tech cold war, marked by a couple of things. First, a security dilemma. What that means from a technology perspective is developments in technology, the distinction between what is offensive and defensive is really difficult to make because you have a zero-sum mentality. We have systemic rivalry, perhaps not at the level that we saw with USSR um, and the states uh, during the initial Cold War, but we certainly have it, and you can see it manifest in a number of ways. One good example is the response to COVID-19, where uh, the Chinese government did not want to use, uh, quote unquote, non-Chinese developed vaccines in response to COVID-19 and with devastating effects, unfortunately. And then finally, all of this is playing out across a, a number of, of technologies. And in the book, we look at the entire tech stack. So from the component level of semiconductors through hardware, software, data layer, infrastructure, cloud layer, all the way through to applications. And we demonstrate, we think quite effectively, uh, that the stack is in fact bifurcating. What does that mean? That means that we're living in an increasing bipolar world with sort of two magnetic fields from a technology perspective. It is really important to say that that does not mean that there are only two countries that really matter or that the whole world will split into two, but there are two poles that are pulling everyone in between across the two, and that is having implications for technology developments. So what is happening is we, went, we have gone from a globalized technology stack to indigenous technology. And I think the problem there is it's, it, it, there may be very legitimate national security reasons for, for doing so, but there are also very real costs to that. 
So who will win the tech cold war? Um, I think there's a mistaken belief in Washington in particular that because it went quote unquote well last time, that that is deterministic for how it will go this time. Uh, from my perspective, the winners will be those who understand that the need to control technology is not just about innovation and production, but also about adoption and diffusion. The winners will be the ones who will be successful in not inventing a lot of technology, but adopting it and diffusing it. And I think this is where UAE has been particularly successful in developing itself as sort of an AI powerhouse in particular for the entire MENA region. And so this dynamic, unfortunately, we are locked into. It is having implications for geopolitics. It is having implications for technology. Um, how to get out of it is difficult. Um, in China, there is a drive for what's called technology, secure and controllable technology. And that sort of is shifting the balance in China between innovation and growth and security. And unfortunately, having effects on the, on the Chinese economy, you see um, high numbers of youth unemployment, lower growth. There was an FT report um, on Sunday that talked about the, the very stark decline in the number of, of companies being started in China, the number of venture capital flow that's happening in China. And at the same time, in the US, you are seeing an increasing use of export controls and national security regulation to essentially contain, from a technology perspective, China. And so National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has this strategy that he calls uh, small yard high fence. So you contain a small number areas of technology and you put up a really high fence for that. The problem is most of the advancements that we're seeing now in technology is general purpose GPTs, not to be mistaken with chat GPT, but general purpose technology. So the AI system that you use to better predict cancer developments and hopefully help cure cancer is the same AI that can be used for national security purposes. The same semiconductor chip that you use for a missile defense system is the same semiconductor chip that will be used for clean energy. Hmm. And so for the US, it's a challenge around how to navigate the national security controls balance with continuing tech diffusion. I agree, I think that it's quite a blurred line you know, um, for example, as someone born and raised in the UAE, I saw the technological advancements and the innovation that was happening, but at the same time, the UAE made sure we're being innovative, we're gonna be safe. We're being innovative, we're gonna be transparent. For them, the end goal is security for their citizens, for their residents, and I think that all nations should always have the same end goal. Just like you said, there's like a, the, they're in between the innovation and at the same time the global security. I want to go to uh, His Excellency Amran Sharaf. I want to ask about since we're here in the UAE, I want on a global scale and on a local scale, which technologies will have the most significant impact on geopolitics in the next decade? It's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, but first of all, thank you for having me here. And uh, actually, if I may answer based on, on, on the outstanding answer that Nicholas actually uh, addressed in his, his answer when you asked him the question. Um, so when it comes to the emerging technologies, critical technologies, there's an element of it that's very unpredictable. The side of it, like, how will you succeed in developing that technology? But also there's another side of how will you adopt it? Uh, and the landscape has changed a lot. And when it comes to geopolitics and geotech, for example, if you look at it today, it's very different than how it was in the 90s or how it was in the 80s or 70s. Um, after World War II, when it came to diplomacy, uh, the main element that affected dipl diplomacy was politics, pure politics. Uh, and that's, again, what affect, ge affected geopolitics. So naturally, diplomacy was affected by politics. But then the geopolitical landscape changed uh, during the Cold War. And after the Cold War, again, there was a shift in, 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 in the landscape, the geopolitical landscape. So the focus was economics and politics. So diplomacy was about economics and politics. Today, there's a third element that came into this, into this mix, which affects the landscape, again, of geopolitics, and that's technology. And more specifically, critical and emerging technologies. And UAE being a hub will definitely be affected by that. 
not just from an economical point of view, but even from a geopolitical point of view, because we are in a quite harsh region. It's a region that, uh, from a geopolitical point of view, especially the past few decades, it's not been very stable. Um, so, being able to navigate the geopolitical challenges, the economical challenges, and using technology to address these is critical for the UAE. It's critical for the region. But then there's another challenge that comes up with that also. Being a hub, the fact that for centuries before the UAE was even established, this area was a hub. We always connected the east to the west. So it's part of our DNA. So our nation, like national interest dictates that we work with the east and the west. But then again, the polarization that's happening uh, when it comes to technology definitely affects us. So I believe countries that are in a position similar to the UAE would need to find a way to navigate this rough landscape. How are we able to work with the East and West, maintain our sovereignty, but at the same time maintain our credibility? Uh, so sometimes it's not for us about choosing sides. It's more about putting systems in place, processes in place that we uh, kind of address the challenges that uh, are highlighted by our, by our key partners, but at the same time, address our national needs and our national interest. So what's the answer for that? I don't know yet, but there's a lot of kind of uh, learning happening today, and especially with the way that technology and AI is one of the many examples will come up uh, in the future. Uh, I think it's an excellent learning experience. We, at the global scale, are very reactive to how AI uh, has impacted our lives, and at the same time, what are the potentials and the risks associated with it? So you can see us, all the countries around the world, like rushing, trying to find ways to, 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 to govern it, but at the same time, not over-govern it. Um, and I think that will be a very important learning experience for us, especially when it comes to other emerging technologies, whether it's in fusion uh, nuclear technologies, whether it's in quantum, uh, life sciences, genomes, and, and furthermore. Uh, so countries who use this opportunity to learn the most out of this experience and position themselves are the ones who will be able to get the most out of it and navigate. Yeah. I think that also there is, to an extent, a divide with, you mentioned, for example, the COVID situation and how China wanted to just use their vaccines or their uh, whatever in terms of COVID. I want to know, in your opinion, in terms of technology, is there a, a growing technological divide? And if so, how can we address the growing technological divide between nations to ensure a more equitable global order? Uh, really good question, really important point. And I think His Excellency already alluded to it. I think the first thing to say is uh, AI can do a lot of wonderful things. Uh, I'm a personally very strong believer in the foundational uh, shift that we will see um, from the advancement of AI, but it also will undoubtedly exacerbate the already existing tech technology digital divide, if you will, in particular with Global, global South. I think that's important to recognize, um, first and foremost. Secondly, that's why it's so important that you have, again, UAE. I looked at Hugging Face this morning. I don't know how many of you are familiar, but uh, TII and UAE are doing a lot of really, really cool things. So. There is now an, an open LLM performance benchmark in Hawking Face that's been developed by um, TI here in UAE that ranks Arabic language LLMs. You have Core 42, an offshoot of G42 that obviously is a close partner for Microsoft that have developed a lot of um, really cool technology in this space and they're working with them. You have the Falcon, I think when it first came out last year, it was a year and a half ago, was the, the highest performing open source model in the world. Falcon 2 was out recently, it's now multimodal. Um, you have another startup called Cluster Lab here in UAE that have developed a, a training data set with 100 billion they're words in Arabic. Game. They're ahead of their game. And so <laughs> I think UAE, I, yesterday I heard someone say sort of it's US, China, and in, in UK and in uh, UAE too, and even UAE in, in some ways just uh, briefly uh, behind the US and China. I actually think it's not uh, too far from the truth. I think you guys are doing amazing work in part because of public-private partnership. 
and this is where I'll get to um, the Microsoft element of it. I, uh, I can't take any credit for this because it happened before I joined Microsoft and I have not been involved in it. Um, but I think the partnership that we have uh, done with the US government, with the UAE government, actually the first uh, intergovernmental assurance agreement in the world created as part of Microsoft's partnership with G42, and a lot of the good work that was made on the part of UAE government has enabled that partnership. Not only that, but jointly then we have done a partnership with the Kenyan government, investing more than a billion do dollars jointly to build things like a sustainable data center that will enable cloud infrastructure in East Africa. We're supporting innovation labs in Nairobi that will help um, grow and build the ecosystem there. And Microsoft and G42 jointly will put our resources to bear to make sure that's done safely and securely. Those types of partnerships is exactly what we need as someone that came from a startup world, from a social entrepreneur. Um, ship background, I know how important it is to get the ecosystem right and build it right. So important to recognize there is a divide, important to recognize that there's potential challenges with the technology if we don't um, develop it responsibly, if we don't govern it safely. Um, but I think, again, UAE is taking steps here to, to show the rest of the world how that could be done with public-private partnerships and things like open source development. About the public-private partnerships, I want to know, as someone from your position and based in the UAE, from the UAE's experience, how can nations protect their strategic interests while also fostering an environment of open innovation and scientific exchange? So yes, and, and, and this goes back to the point you raised, that public-private partnership is critical for that, um, in which you wanna inspire and encourage and enhance innovation. Uh, you want to have incremental innovation, but also you want to have disruptive of innovation. And it comes hand in hand when it comes to uh, working between the private sector and the public sector. Usually what we say, like the government sector or the government is the one that takes care of disruptive innovation. And then the private sector comes in and does the incremental. Uh, so that ecosystem is very critical. But with that ecosystem also, transparency comes up. Uh, systems that you put in place that builds trust within the scientific and technical community in the country, whether it's in the private sector or the public sector or in the academia, which is the triple helix usually model that uh, countries have to have to be able to have a proper ecosystem, uh, then, the, then this is how you're able to kind of set the right uh, mindset and the right uh, culture within your scientific and technical community uh, through these partnerships. Because uh, at the end of the day, sometimes there's national security interest that needs to be addressed by the government, but then you need to be very creative to address the upcoming challenges, and you need to be quick in finding those, those solutions. And that's where you need to bring the academia into, into, into the picture and the private sector. So it's a very uh, delicate kind of balance that you need to, 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 to reach uh, with that. But then what's more important that happens in this kind of relationship that I believe will have to be even replicated and international partnerships between nations at a strategic level, is that within a nation, when you have the, the academic, public, and private working together, you have a high level of transparency and trust in the sense that I trust you with my IP, and you trust me uh, with, 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 with your IP. Uh, and I give you my trade secrets, and you give me my trade secrets. It creates the interdependencies within the ecosystem in the nation. But given what's happening currently at the global level with technology and the scientific discoveries that's happening and, and the new achievements that will happen in the, in the future and how it's affecting pol politics and geopolitics, that will, model will be, have to be replicated at a global scale. Nations will have to work together and have to be open and have to put safeguards and systems in place that brings in transparency, uh, emphasizes, emphasizes the responsible behavior, uh, build the right team culture and trust between nations. And going back to the point early on that uh, Nicholas mentioned was basically it will, it will be very difficult for countries to navigate that and the ones who will get the most out of it are the ones who will be able to develop this technology, use it, but also know where to focus on and collaborate with others. So it's going to probably turn into clusters of countries yeah. or blocks of countries working together. That's how the global maybe uh, approach to technopolitics would be. Uh, in which me as a UAE, I'll be focusing on this side of the system. Uh, you as, as, as the US will be focusing on this part of the system and we work together to develop a bigger system and compete globally. And this is why the G42 Microsoft agreement is very important is because an, it's an excellent demonstration 
for how this model could be used in the new emerging technologies. The UAE has done this before in the space program and in the nuclear program, and it was successful. We didn't start from scratch. In the space program, for example, nations usually take the approach of, I'll start everything on my own. It's the competition approach. The UAE took the collaborative approach. That's why after the start of our space program, in 15, 15 years, we were able to reach Mars because we didn't start from scratch. We learned from others. In, in, in Earth observation missions, we learned from the South Koreans. In the nuclear program, we learned from the South Koreans. In, in, in our deep space missions from the US. Until this day, the teams are working with those counterparts, even on our own missions, in which by default, because we are comfortable working with these nations, we understand their design approach, we understand uh, their, their risk approach, so it makes sense for us to work with them. But that brought also transparency, interlinks and interdependencies, which are critical in the area of emerging technology, which we will hopefully see that happening in the G42 uh, Microsoft uh, partnership. I'm curious, actually, just to follow up on what you said, um... What, how do you mitigate a breach of transparency? By putting safeguards, by being transparent, uh, by having the right team culture, the mindset. At the end of the day, no matter how many systems you put in place, policies, rules, regulations, people will find ways, in a creative way, to break those. So it's about the personal responsibility. It's about also taking into account the biases that people have also like in them. So, so having the right team culture within your science and tech community is critical. Mm -hmm. And approaching it also, not in an emotional way, when it comes to geopolitics as, as diplomats or politicians, but in a, in a proactive way in, way in which we understand the national interests and concerns of the other side and taking it into account and focusing more on the solution and not being emotional. Um, so that's another aspect that's very critical also. So there's that kind of your scientific, and communi uh, scientific community that needs to be having a certain mindset and team culture, but then also your politicians and diplomats and need to, to, to approach things slightly more different than, 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 than the, the, the usual way of doing things. Right. And on an on international scale, yeah. so um, just I'm saying this from the top of my head, like we saw what the U.S. is what's happening right now with in terms of TikTok and the U.S. and well, we remember the semiconductors mm -hmm. crisis as well. Um, what role should international organizations play in governing the development and deployment of t potentially disruptive technologies? Um, I, 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 again, another good question. I think it depends slightly on the technology. So you should ask His Excellency about space because he knows <laughs> uh, more about me and many things and in particular this area, but I can speak to AI. Um, from an AI perspective, the technology is just moving so fast. Like uh, even as we're speaking, I'm sure there'll be news uh, that will happen, some development will happen and governments are really chasing to keep up and I think there's a risk that everyone gets in front of their skis a little bit and we don't in do enough to ensure interoperability on the regulatory side. I think this is where international organizations play a critical role. But also maybe important to, instead of just looking at the shiny new thing that AI is, it, look back at the history and experience that we've had in global governance. You alluded to it, but I think, I mean, this, this forum celebrates the history thousands of years. Let's just go back a couple of decades and look at what happened with civil aviation, what happened with nuclear, what happened with the financial system. Well, with civil aviation development completely transformed, early 20th century completely transformed culture, commerce, e even war. When we found out neutrons could split the atom, fundamentally changed energy, but also created potential devastating weapons. Financial system has survived Great Depression, another depression, a couple of world wars. We have now established a system that has tremendous opportunity for innovation and growth, but also have inherent systemic risk. So rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, it's really important that we look at some of the experiences and lessons from global governance in other areas. And so, for example, if you look at things like CERN, if you look at things like ICAO, there's a lot of things that can be taught from an AI perspective in terms of sharing information, ensuring information flow, ensuring accurate deployment of resources, lowering barriers for cooperation. If you look at organizations like IAEA have done a, FSB have done a tremendous job in managing and monitoring global systemic risk. Um, 
on the plane over um, from Frankfurt um, to Dubai, I sat next to a gentleman and we, we started talking. He had a book that I was interested in and, and it turned out to be Dr. Eldrin. I don't know if people know who he is, but he was the secretary general for OPEC and was very senior person in IAEA. And I asked him, I'm giving this talk. Can you give me some advice? You have a lot of experience in IAEA. Like, how did you manage it? Obviously, nuclear there's a lot of similarities with the developments of AI. And he said two things made the difference. One, we were able to take out politics of it. And coming back to my original argument, that is really important because that happened at the height of the Cold War. Mm. You established IAEA. But then he said the second piece why it was so salient to people was you had seen the devastation that happened in Hiroshima and elsewhere from nuclear weapons. We do not have that, thankfully, with AI yet let's make sure that we have the regulation in place, that it's safe so we don't need that driver, but we understand the importance of taking out, I think to your point, taking out the politics or taking, not, not be emotional about it from a geopolitical perspective, but recognizing it, creating the space. And again, I talked initially about this bipolar world. People sometimes mistakenly think Cold War was all about US and USSR, and this is a static, um, System. It was not. It was incredibly dynamic, and the non-aligned movement had more than 120 countries subscribe to it. In fact, a lot of those countries were the most important players in that. Now, the Economist has this argument. They call it the transactional 25. UAE is one of them. UAE is actually the one that has the most diversified trade in all of those 25 countries, and it not only trades with U.S. and China, but also with a lot of other countries. It, those 25 countries will determine the push and pull between uh, U.S. And, and China. I do think that it's important to say, however, the way that things are going, it, you might be faced with increasing difficulty to manage both. Mm. And there's push on both sides to have countries like the UAE, quote unquote, pick sides. I think it'll be really important to continue to navigate that. And we need more uh, diplomats who have the engineering background and can speak eloquently um, to navigate that, who understands the technology and the politics of it. Yeah. And I want to know about navigation. How is the concept of national sovereignty evolving in the digital age? And what challenges does this pose for traditional governance models? It's changing, governing is changing every single day, every single year. So. So so that's the thing. So the, when it comes to the, to, to the approach, also like it is, it's it's a very complicated uh, issue. You have to look at the, each country's or the partnering nations' political system. Uh, some countries, the administrations change every every years. The policies change with that. So how can I kind of stabilize that relationship in the way, regardless of the changes? Still, we are working together uh, on on a specific. Uh, uh, area that is related to technology or emerging technology. Um, there's another aspect you have to take into account also. I mean, each country has their own national interests. Mm -hmm. Superpowers have their national interests. Middle powers have their national interests. Any nation has their national interests at the end of the day. So being considerate of that, taking that into account, I think will help us navigate. It's not going to be easy. Uh, but then is it a risk? It's a huge risk. And it's becoming much, much more complicated today. And what's adding to that risk also, especially with what's happening and the level of creativity and innovation around the world that's happening, the, the, the line or the distinction between civilian and military technology and research is becoming more and more like gray and blurry. Uh, it's not as clear as before. So if you ask me today, what is your assessment of most of the technologies around the world today? Are they civilian or military? I'll tell you, they're all dual use. I think there will be a shift in the conversations from purely military, purely civilian, to dual use discussions. I think the current global challenges, if you look at what's happening in Yemen, uh, in the Red Sea, if you look at what's happening uh, between Ukraine and Russia, if you look what's happening in Iran and other countries, if you look how countries are deploying different weapons and, 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 and being creative about it, and it might be categorized as maybe uh, amateur uh, systems, but they are disrupting, they are impacting, regardless if it's effect, uh, very effective or not, but there is an effect. They are dis 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 disturbing the, the, the business routes, they are causing uh, destabilization and so on. Um, and what's happening also now, that knowledge that before was 
only maintained by states. Now we see non-state actors having access to ballistic technologies, to drones technologies. Can you imagine one day if the emerging technologies also go in the hands of non-state actors? So when do we draw the line? So this is why it's very difficult. That's why countries will be forced to work together. Countries will be forced at some point, I believe, to understand they cannot make all the countries choose sites. You know, at the end of the day, I mean, as I said, we all work towards our national interests. What we need to focus on is putting systems in place in which we respect and adhere and uh, make sure that our partners are not affected because our credibility is critical mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Um, so so is, is there a, a clear solution? No. The, every country has its own solution, its own mm -hmm. equation, and that equation also is dependent on its partner, partnering country. For example, the, the equation that we'll use for our relationship with South Korea will be very different than the, relationship, the, the equation that we use for our relationship with the UK, for example, or the US. Uh, same thing with, 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 uh, with, uh, with the US. The equation they'll use with the UAE will be different than the equation they'll use with, for example, Japan. Yeah. So understanding that and that you cannot just take a blank kind of standard template and apply it in all your relationship is critical. And some countries will learn that faster than others. And the ones who understand that faster and quicker, they'll do that. And one thing I would like to explain also, when it comes to, again, advanced, emerging, critical technologies. Any country that has strategic capability in these areas will put some sort of control on the access of that technology and on the access of knowledge of that technology. That will happen. So any country that comes and says, no, we don't have it. If you don't have it, that means you're not at the cutting edge yet. And if you are at the cutting edge, you will put it. So that's something, again, going back to that point, is that that's the reality of the landscape. We need to be we shouldn't be emotional about it. We need to be proactive about it and, and, and look at it from a realistic point of view and address the, the challenge and, and focus on the solutions rather than the problems. It's definitely a gray area with people, either white or black. And it's uh, such a complicated and big topic to talk about. What, due to time constraints, I have just one last two questions, obviously one for each, which is the same question. Is geotech a new reality? Nicholas, you could start if you'd like. I'll keep it short and sweet, yes. And if you push back or if you don't recognize it, you will lose. Yes, definitely. And I think last year's the United Nations General Assembly's meeting, the high-level week when all the head of states were in the UN, almost every single head of state addressed technology, technology, and technology. That didn't happen before. But it tells you that it is a reality. Finish. It's, you cannot avoid it, and you will have to deal with it. Yeah. And how can we maintain, as geo, geotech is the new reality, and we've all established that, and you said that to maintain global security, everyone is supposed to interfere. How can nations interfere and still maintain security? Not interfere, collaborate. Collaborate. You need to collaborate, yeah. So you need to find ways to collaborate in a transparent way. You need to, way to, to sort of create that interdependencies uh, you need to start, trust your partners with your IP, and, and, and you, the partner needs to trust you with their IP also, in which you generate together new foreground IP. And that's the kind of the dependencies that we'll see happening uh, sooner or later. Do you guys have anything to add? No, just to add to that, I think I, I've already mentioned the partnership here, but another example of this is um, there's a big challenge in the U.S. market to develop uh, icebreakers for Arctic um, uh, naval patrols. And so US, Canada, and I think Finland joined together to essentially co-build those. Those are the type of intergovernmental partnerships with industry that will set the standard for how we'll go forward. Again, the US-UAE Intergovernmental Assurance Agreement to the point of the importance of securing this technology, having credibility, but then also partnering to make sure that you can leverage the progress that the technologies will create safely and securely. That's what will be the model going forward. Again, I have to say, I don't, I don't mean to, to, to give sort of unwarranted flattery, but I really do think that UAE has, um, if not nailed, then at least approximated a model for how to do this. For sure. Thank you guys so much for this insightful conversation. And thanks to the audience for listening.